Dr. Adam Law is an ecologist uh, and he had MD, PhD from Whale Cornell Medical College. He is a clinical assistant professor of medicine and specializes in internal medicine, of course, and in technology and metabolic medicine and diabetes. He is in private practice. Dr. Law received his medical degree and doctorate at University of London. He did postdoctoral fellowship at the University of California and Cornell. He speaks widely on the threats of human health posed by environmental contamination. I have heard him before. It will be a very interesting uh, presentation. Please welcome Dr. Adam Law. Thank you. Um, I'm a physician, an endocrinologist. I'm in uh, both primary care and endocrinology. I started this morning uh, at 7 o'clock at the Cayuga Medical Center. I saw a patient towards the end of her life. And then I had the privilege of going into the labor room and saw a, a newborn baby. Uh, the mother I had been treating for diabetes, and I realized what an incredible privilege it is uh, to be in my profession. I also reflect upon the fact that uh, we put a huge amount of energy uh, into saving one life. Preventing illness, therefore, is extraordinarily uh, important. I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Finger Lakes Clean Waters Initiative uh, for uh, creating this symposium, uh, Chris Tate, Adam Flint, Chris Berger, and also uh, Dr. Walid uh, Hamoud. In fact, uh, the inspiration for this particular presentation um, came from another talk I gave to the Broome County Medical Society in which I was rescued by Dr. Uh, Hamoud from a particular line of uh, questioning which I had not anticipated. I've never had to enter into any controversial areas and I was, I'm used to colleagues asking me awkward technical questions, but I was not at all used to being asked loaded questions. Uh, maybe I should call this talk, uh, uh, are you still beating your wife? Um, and uh, because yesterday was the small splash and tomorrow is the big splash, I thought I would have a very different kind of presentation for you in which I invert the usual order where you give a formal presentation and then you're asked awkward or hopefully reasonable questions. Instead, what I decided to do was to take uh, the uh, loaded questions, the, the leading questions, the misleading statements, uh, the begging the question, and evaluate this. Uh, because all of these are an appeal to emotion rather than to reason. And I've given it a lot of thought, well, how do we deal with this? You know, when we're confronted with these questions, we're coming up here honestly uh, to talk. And uh, how do you actually deal with these kinds of questions? And finally, I've come to the conclusion the best way to deal with them is first with humor, good humor, because anger and irritation are playing into the wrong end of uh, this. We need to, to be able to discharge whatever emotion is trying to be invoked. And then secondly, to answer it to the best as we can uh, with reason. Um, I'm a founding member uh, of PSC, which is Physicians, Scientists and Engineers uh, for a Healthy Energy. Uh, one of our co-founders is in the audience, uh, Stan Scobies. Uh, we are trying, uh, as an independent, uh, non-profit organization, essentially to do just this, which is to uh, bring evidence to bear on this discussion and to frame that evidence with ethics. I got interested in this particular question uh, of hydraulic fracturing, and I'm using that as a, as a term to encompass the whole life cycle of this process, uh, not just the technical issue of the hydraulic fracturing process itself, so I'll just call it hydraulic fracturing for the whole life cycle of it. Uh, because patients ask me, uh, 
what are the endocrine effects of this? What's, how's it going to affect your hormones? You're an endocrinologist. Tell us how it's going to be. So in December 2009, I, I went on a very rapid learning curve and uh, managed to get uh, some evidence into the uh, draft supplementary uh, environmental impact statement. And uh, subsequently, as that got picked up, I started having to, being invited to give talks. Um, I am proud to say that in our town, a variety of different doctors were leaders, um, and uh, we managed to have a resolution passed uh, in Tompkins County, Broome County followed, and a number of others, and now the uh, New York State Medical Society itself uh, is on record in uh, December of last year for having a resolution saying there should be a continued moratorium on hydraulic fracturing until we know more about uh, the effects on health and the environment. So um, what I did was I had this conversation with a student uh, of, arch uh, of architecture at Cornell University who is a, in his spare time, a wannabe cartoonist. And I said, okay, I'm gonna tell you some of these questions I've been asked and I'm gonna ask you to respond to them. So uh, I've somewhat w uh, changed the title of my talk from this rather dry title to something which hopefully will wake you up this afternoon if we can go to the next slide. There's unloading questions on fracking and health. So we have loaded questions, and I'm going to take just a few examples, just four, and try a little bit to unload these questions. Um, the first uh, one which I want to uh, talk about is the uh, one which many of you may have heard. There is no evidence of harm from hydraulic fracturing. Has anyone heard this one before? Yes. Okay. So if we can go to the next slide, this is how uh, Santi uh, uh, Slade responded to this. Well, if you don't do it, we'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> but it brings a very serious point. Uh, what do we mean by evidence of harm? What, what are we talking about? What do you mean there's no evidence of harm? Um, a very uh, interesting anecdote was published in that famous uh, medical uh, journal, the Durango Herald in uh, Colorado, this particular uh, unfortunate uh, person, an, a nurse working in an emergency department at Mercy Regional Medical Center, um, was on one day when a gas field worker came in soaked with, I think it was Optic Clean, but certainly one of these agents, head to toe soaked. Uh, she uh, felt, smelt this sweet acrid smell, got the guy to strip off, double-bagged everything, disposed of it. Meanwhile, a co-worker shut the emergency room down and uh, made sure that it was uh, properly ventilated and uh, cleared afterwards. She thought not too much of it immediately after. This was a Thursday, I think. And uh, she did notice a little later in the day a headache. Uh, by the following Monday, she was back in her own emergency room uh, with what she thought was a flu-like illness, and uh, they gave her some antibiotics, and they also gave her oxygen to take home, which means that this was pretty significant, whatever was happening. By the end of the week, she was in her own um, intensive care unit with lung failure and liver failure and multiple organ failure. Um, all they had to work on was the material safety data sheet, which said Optic Clean. They couldn't find out what was in it. Um, it was just a proprietary name. Uh, the uh, ICU doctor took a very good stab at it um, and treated her appropriately and supportively, and fortunately she was able to go back to work. She wasn't somebody who was particularly for or against the industry, but she uh, felt very strongly that she should bring this story uh, to the Colorado, Colorado Oil and Gas Commission, and uh, this was essentially uh, blocked uh, by Halliburton because uh, they didn't want to disclose what was in uh, the uh, particular proprietary uh, chemical, uh, what, what the real chemicals were, and they said they would rather move out of Colorado entirely than uh, disclose this. So, anyhow, the uh, question uh, in all of these uh, stories of contamination is uh, that this is um, just an anecdotal evidence. This is not real evidence. It could have been something else. Maybe she had the flu. And there are always contravening uh, pieces of evidence that come in which make you doubt. Well, maybe it wasn't uh, this particular substance which the person was exposed to which caused the problem. 
So this is a, a very big problem with anecdotal evidence. But I want to just say to you, and any physician will tell you this, that our entire careers are based upon anecdotal evidence. What we call anecdotal evidence is the patient's history. It's what they're telling you. We don't throw it away. So I would say to you that anecdotal evidence is very important. The stories that people are telling, the stories that you've heard from uh, neighbors or from just over the state, these are very important stories. They're not systematically collected. They're not in the medical journals. But these stories are like the canary in the mine. They're warning us that something is going wrong. So the um, question then is, is there any evidence? Well, there is one, uh, there's nothing, uh, as I will just talk about in a second, in uh, the medical journals, but uh, there is one survey uh, which, is in a, uh, which is online uh, by Wilma Subra, which is, uh, in fact, part, uh, filed uh, as part of the Oil and Gas Accountability Project. Uh, some of you may remember from Gasland, the town of Dish, uh, Texas. Uh, she surveyed 31 individuals uh, who were from 4 to 69 years of age in the October and November of 2009. Um, most of them consider themselves to be fairly healthy individuals. But, in a, uh, but most, most, about 39% said that they had some symptoms of sickness uh, three days per week. And 71% uh, of these uh, were, were respiratory symptoms. And they also included things like sinus throat irritation, allergies, uh, weakness, fatigue, eye pain, nasal irritation, and so forth. This never uh, went to anything peer-reviewed. And uh, that's, uh, I think, lamentable, but uh, that's the way it is. Um, in the, at the Colorado School of Public Health, Roxana Witter and colleagues um, were commissioned by the NRDC uh, to review the li literature in a rigorous fashion uh, between 2003 and 2008. They had 5,063 articles from the entire medical literature, and they used very, very broad search terms in order on oil and gas to try and get every article ever published in that particular range. They found that uh, after reviewing, they got 5,063. Of those, 83 were, 831 were worth reviewing. 231 might had a reference to fracking, and a sum total of zero were worth uh, actually reporting. None of them uh, actually stood up to any major evidence-based uh, criteria. The studies were not uh, constructed in any fashion that would be worth reporting. So uh, that's very disappointing. And um, I got involved in this and uh, found uh, somebody else who was an enthusiast, and that's Madeleine Finkel, who's Professor of Public Health at Weill Cornell Medical College. And the two of us um, wrote uh, the first reviewed, uh, peer-reviewed commentary on hydraulic fracturing, which came out last month in the American Journal of Public Health. So subsequently, when we did our own evidence-based uh, uh, search, of the entire literature with no time constraints and came up with absolutely nothing as well, which is quite interesting, uh, we felt uh, that there is a high time that we start uh, to study this. Um, if we don't study this area, we will certainly never know. And uh, at the moment, uh, we're in the, the situation of thinking about how to construct epidemiological studies and, in fact, are trying to pull together a conference of epidemiologists in the first uh, order. These are people who study um, disease uh, to see the best ways, uh, best me methodologies possible uh, to go ahead and create the kind of evidence that we need. We need this evidence soon, and there are some strategies to obtain it, but as, I, as you might, might imagine, there are barriers which are to do with funding, uh, getting the right kind of scale, collaborations need to be created. So the second uh, uh, slide, which we'll come to in a second, uh, was the one that inspired this talk and which I was rescued about. I was asked when I was talking to these physicians at the end by somebody, um, how did you get here today? And I thought, what? Repeat the question, please. 
And he said, how did you get to this symp uh, symposium today? And I said, well, I, I, I carpooled. I thought, ah, he's going to ask me, the he's trapping me into the hydrocarbon question here. You know, if you drove on your own and you're using hydrocarbons, you're being irresponsible. And he said, no. Uh, whenever you get into a car, there is risk. There's risk with everything. All the things that we do in our lives, there is some associated risk. And we can try and reduce the risk, and therefore we should uh, not be uh, critical or question this, uh, the progress of hydraulic fracturing. We should be giving leases, and we'll learn as we go along. Life is not without risk. So I think that um, that was a, a pretty difficult one uh, to, uh, to try and face. And uh, this is my cartoonist. Uh, it's not safe, but it's fast. <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, the truth of the matter is, yes, uh, there, is, uh, there is risk. And we've already talked a little earlier about the precautionary principle, which is the uh, ethical precept, which is similar to the ethics which bind physicians in their practice with patients, which is to do no harm. And we do really need to be able to understand the processes before we move ahead. Unfortunately, um, we had, the horse has already bolted in many other states, but that hasn't happened here. And I do think that we need to, uh, to actually proceed with studies. But one phenomenon as an endocrinologist I want to bring to your attention is the phenomenon of endocrine disruption. The reason I, I'm raising this is that there are big question marks and imponderables that we cannot, at this point, put any kind of number to. Endocrine disruption um, was coined as a term at a conference uh, that was presided over by Theo Coborn, whose name you probably may have heard already responsible for the endocrine disruption exchange. This was her first really great contribution to the field, and uh, it came out of studying uh, the Great Lakes ecology 20 or 30 years after they supposedly were cleaned up and where they found that bioaccumulation of uh, toxins affected the reproduction of birds and other uh, animals in, in that particular environment. But uh, she found that it actually described and fitted well in many other areas of toxicology and other uh, parts of uh, endocrinology and that certain substances in incredibly small amounts or concentrations can cause marked uh, effects um, at particularly during fetal life, at, at, at particular time windows, critical time windows, which have lasting effects. Uh, unfortunately, in our profession, uh, a prototypic endodis endocrine disruptor is called diethylstilbestrol. In my medical practice, I'm seeing patients still who are the daughters of individuals who are ex of women who who are exposed to this in their pregnancies. It was prescribed as something to stop spontaneous uh, miscarriages and subsequently uh, became rather like a vitamin you gave women during pregnancy and millions uh, were affected. Unlike thalidomide, which one knew about immediately at birth, uh, there was like a 20 year or so time window until the first cases of a very rare vaginal ca cancer was seen uh, in Boston um, which was only usually seen in, el in the elderly population. And uh, one of the patients uh, asked uh, their physician, my, my mother was on DES, uh, could this uh, be associated? And when he asked some of these other patients, he found the connection. Subsequent to that, um, a very large literature has arisen uh, to do with the uh, way in which the reproductive tracts of uh, women, particularly their uteruses, and uh, also in men, uh, uh, rare forms of testicular cancer, um, arose many years later. And uh, this, in a way, has been one of the um, sort of iatrogenic or doctor-caused uh, disasters. And uh, has been a model for how uh, endocrine disruptors work. 
And since then, many, uh, many have been found. I notice that some of you are carrying around metal water bottles. Uh, there's a concern about uh, uh, bi uh, bisphenol A, which uh, is an endocrine disruptor, which is fa and other plasticizers in plastic uh, bottles. And a lot of people have uh, chosen to convert over to metal water bottles. Um, I think that uh, you know already this notion of endocrine disruption has uh, entered the popular imagination. On the other hand, in Ithaca, we have days where you can dispose of your drugs safely uh, so that you don't put them in the water. You've all read stories about chemicals entering into uh, the water supply, um, particularly uh, things like oral contraceptive pills and so forth, which might potentially have uh, effects, particularly on women who are pregnant. Um, Sandra Steingrubber has written a lot about uh, a number of these. Um, the, the problem uh, with the... Uh, hydraulic fracturing fluids and the, and, the, and the flow back fluids is that we do not know uh, what uh, proportion of them are endocrine disruptors. And as I will mention uh, shortly, because there's not complete disclosure, we cannot study them and rule them out. Uh, I would say that if we, would, we really should be able to identify these. Um, they don't just have effects on the reproductive tract. Um, I went to a, uh, a, a conference in Paris in November on multi-system endocrine disruption. It's uh, involved in many areas uh, later in life, uh, metabolic areas, diabetes, obesity, um, even, in, uh, gas even in gastroenterology. Uh, there are many different examples of how endocrine disruptors can have dramatic effects. And they work, uh, or a number of them work, by actually uh, affecting the very differentiation uh, of uh, cells by uh, altering the pattern of uh, methylation or other, um, other uh, processes on DNA, which can then be passed on to the daughter cells and which are involved in particular tissues becoming um, expressing certain genes or not exp uh, uh, expressing certain genes. A very uh, interesting uh, review by Stephen Rappaport and uh, Martin Smith, uh, which came out uh, in uh, Science last year, talked about the to total human exposome and that uh, we are exposed to many toxic chemicals. Most chronic diseases appear to be environmental and not purely to genetic, and that we should be studying this as the next big science project after the human genome. How can we uh, find the chemicals in our systems which are exposed to which modify um, our genome and therefore produce chronic ill health? This is another one of the questions uh, which is that these chemicals, what are you worrying about? They're in common use in your own home. Uh, there's a wonderful Halliburton website, which some of you may have come across, which helpfully lists some of these chemicals with their unique chemical abstract numbers and tells us the common use that they have in the house. I mean, very usefully, uh, acetic acid is used as a, as a preservative. And then at the bottom of the list, the one which I found the most interesting of all was something called water. And uh, I think that most of us are, are, are using this quite frequently. Uh, I don't know if it's worrying. I imagine if one takes too much of it, it might be a problem. Um, having said that, um, it is not uh, uh, an untruth that we do, we do surround ourselves with chemicals. And some of the chemicals we've talked about already are in, uh, commonly in use in our households. But that doesn't necessarily act as a very good example to us. Um, because uh, we should be rethinking that. And there's often substitutes that we can make. And there's a whole a sort of in domestic environmental movement that's really addressing this critically. Uh, we don't need to use a lot of these agents. The uh, other issue is that we just don't know all of the things that are in fracking fluid. And uh, this comes from the 2005 uh, Energy Policy Act when the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Clean Air Act were all uh, removed from hydraulic fracturing to make it a cheaper and more uh, possible technology. And uh, consequently, um, we don't know 100% all of these uh, 
these unique chemicals. We know a lot of the products. We've got the material data, uh, safety data sheets. Uh, we have uh, people like uh, Theo Coban who um, has identified many of these. And, uh, but we still don't know 100% of them, and the industry says that they don't want to disclose them for proprietary uh, chemicals, give them a, a competitive advantage. I would say that they should base their, their competitive advantage on other issues. I think that we really need to know, um, policymakers need to know, physicians need to know, and scientists need to know. Uh, we need to be able to screen these chemicals and not allow them into the fracking fluids uh, if they are a, a potential problem as an endocrine disruptor or as a toxin. Of course, I wouldn't want to use glutaraldehyde in my kitchen. Uh, this was one which I came across in a blog that sort of arrested my attention and first got me into the idea of thinking of working with an illustrator, which was, um, you know, if we were so worried about everything, uh, about progress and so forth, we would never have left the caves. So this is uh, the cartoonist uh, impression. We'll leave when we can totally mess up whatever is out there. <laughs> Um, I think that uh, what I'd like to point out is that uh, those of us in the evidence-based uh, community uh, are not against uh, science, we're not against progress. In fact, we spent most of our careers uh, thinking about uh, these issues. Um, I would say that um, most of, many of the great advances in public health um, have been uh, responsible for uh, us living beyond the age of 50 over the last 100 years, uh, rather than new antibiotics or new technical things, it's to do with public health. Um, ever since uh, John Snow took the handle off the pump and prevented the great cholera epidemic in Broad Street in London, um, public health has, gone to, has come very much uh, to the front. There are studies that we can do, and I've alluded to the fact that these are studies we must do uh, to look at uh, hydraulic fracturing as a process and its safety. You might think of it like cigarettes, you know. Cigarettes um, have thousands of different chemicals, many of which are car known carcinogens, some of which are addictive. But in order to look at uh, the uh, potential harm from cigarettes, you don't need to identify the ball, you need to look at what happens to smokers. And that's the public health approach. We need to look at, lo at populations which are defined carefully, uh, in which there is statistical power to come to reasonable inferences. There are many different study designs, um, and uh, they're very well honed, but they, they need to be applied carefully uh, to be able to provide meaningful answers. The studies are not things that are turned around just in a few weeks, sadly. And I would say that uh, we need to do these kinds of studies. Um, we've talked about a survey which has already been done, but there are different designs, cross-sectional designs, which is rather like a survey. Uh, you go into an area which has a high incidence of a particular problem, and you look and see what sorts of diseases are thrown up, and that gives you a hypothesis, and you can look further. There are what are called longitudinal ecological studies, uh, where you look at the same area you, before fracking comes in, fracking comes in, and then you see if any particular illnesses become higher in incidence. Then there are case control studies, where you look at areas which have a lot of fracking and areas which don't, and you look at particular diseases. It's not easy to, to uh, get causality out of that. And finally, there are prospective cohort studies, uh, which is uh, where uh, you can actually follow this over time and look at how exposure uh, in one area and not in another area uh, is associated with the onset of particular diseases. Uh, in this area, we can't do what we do in medicine, which is clinical trials, because we can't uh, make a placebo for a hydraulic fracturing pad, I'm afraid. Um, so we can't do a randomized uh, controlled trial. So uh, I think that's where I will leave it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adam Long.